Hello all, it's just a short video then to talk you through natural hazards. This is the A-level version, so if, obviously if you're studying GCSE, you'll need to switch videos now. So if we go back to basics then, we can talk about the concept of hazards in a geographical context. So these six keywords you see here help us to do that. So if we think about how we group hazards, we can group them first and foremost by their causes. So I might call them geophysical hazards, obviously, if they were caused by land, atmospheric, if they're caused by climate, hydrological, perhaps if they were caused by water. And then from that, I can branch them out a little bit further and I can call them a disaster. So when it seriously affects humans, the hazard risk, I'm thinking about the likelihood that people are going to be affected and people's vulnerability then is just how susceptible a population is to that particular hazard. And so... That leads us quite nicely on to hazard perception. So hazard perception, as it says here, is people's circumstances affecting their perception of hazards. Okay, so you might link that to changing places. In changing places, we talk quite a lot about perceptions of things. And that same sort of thought applies to hazards. So perhaps then human responses here might be to have a fatalism approach. To say, right, well, hazards can't be avoided. So we've just got to accept it. We've got to get on with it. You might work towards prediction and try and work out exactly when and where that hazard's going to occur. Try and adapt, so adjust how you live. Mitigation, so try and reduce the impact. Or you might do something called risk sharing, which is perhaps trying to share the cost of reducing hazards, so are you taking out insurance? So all of those responses there to hazard perception depend on incidents, so how often it's going to happen, how powerful this hazard is, and potentially then the level of development, so whether you're in a HIC, an NEE, or an LIC because obviously these are going to vary between. So if we've thought a bit about sort of the background and how you might view the hazard, I suppose the next logical thing to talk about is plate tectonics and to think about the theory. So if I think about the theory of plate tectonics, that lithosphere is divided into plates. Okay, so we know it used to be one landmass of Pangaea, and we've got evidence in the form of continental drift theory. So you think fossil remains, the seams of rock types match up, the jigsaw shape of the continents, paleomagnetism. They all support continental drift and this idea that our continents used to be joined together as one. If I think about how the plates move, well, I've got my theory of convection currents, of slab pull and ridge push, which is what this diagram here shows us. Well, here then, I know that convection currents is thought to be the main process, okay? But actually, I would suggest that slab pool now is slightly more dominant. Again, if you've forgotten what slab pool is, there's a little definition there for you. So to delve a bit further into this, then we need to consider the structure of the Earth. Again, for the exam, you'll need to know a little bit about what each layer of the Earth is like. In really basic terms, we can say, right, there are four layers here, obviously starting with the core or the inner core, then the outer core, mantle and crust. And that crust then is broken down into continental and oceanic. So continental crust is typically thicker, less dense. Oceanic is typically thinner and denser. So heat left over then from the formation of the Earth and radioactive decay of elements then, such as uranium, is contained and found here. So if I've got all of these plates moving on the surface of my Earth, it's highly likely then that we're going to meet different plate margins. And the first plate margin you need to be aware of is what we call a constructive or a divergent plate margin. Here, the two tectonic plates are going to move apart from each other. And as they're moving apart from each other, we're going to see lots of upwelling or rising of magma and then various different landforms that result from this. So I might see an ocean ridge, particularly underwater volcanoes. I might get a rift valley. So that rising magma causes the crust to bulge and fracture. It's going to cause lots of faults and it might drop down to form that valley. Lots of volcanoes, obviously, if it's rising and it's filling, creating new land. And earthquakes as well. If I've got some plates that are moving faster than others, they're going to be smaller earthquakes. But still, I'm going to have friction and never less an earthquake. If I compare that then to a destructive margin, again, then I'm likely to see four different landforms here. So my fold mountains. I might get, again, volcanoes. The deep sea trench when I get that subduction of an oceanic plate underneath a continental plate and also earthquakes then so if I get one plate moving on another it's highly likely that pressure is going to build up and again result in an earthquake 
If I continue thinking about my oceanic to oceanic convergence or also a destructive margin, I'm going to get island arcs, so clusters of islands that sit in a curved line above the plate margin, deep sea trenches, again volcanoes and earthquakes. I've put sea above here because we've already done that, we've just covered it. Again, if I think about continental to continental convergence, again here I'm going to get fold mountains, which is what this picture is showing us, and also plenty of earthquakes as I get that pressure building up. A conservative margin, where I've got plates that are trying to move past each other. Remember this movement of plates here doesn't always have to be in the same direction. This can also be in opposite directions too. Important to note, I've got no subduction, so no volcanoes here. So the main thing I'm going to find are my earthquakes. Magma plumes or hot spots then. Remember these aren't found at a plate margin. So magma plume column just rises up from the mantle, breaks through the plate, and obviously cools, condenses, and forms as a volcano, which can also lead to a chain of volcanic islands. Think of Hawaii here as your best example. So if I'm thinking about hazards, I've got to consider the park model. The park model is something that goes sort of side by side really here, and it's what this diagram is showing you. The park model says, right, there are sort of five main things that are happening here if I follow this red line or follow the journey on the graph. So pre-disaster, before the event, normal conditions, then I've got disruption, which is sort of like during or immediately after. Relief, which happens in the aftermath. Rehabilitation, once we've got some impacts under control. And then reconstruction, which means basically rebuilding, same or improved standard. If I want to evaluate this park model, you see I've done it here. I might say, well, the positive is it helps predict the resources needed at each stage. Helps with sort of future impacts. In theory, it's going to reduce vulnerability. However, the big negatives here, I think, assumes that humanity doesn't factor into events. Okay, LICs or NEs may not be able to afford the improvements necessary as part of this rehabilitation and reconstruction phase. To go alongside that, then, you've obviously got your hazard management cycle. Hazard management here, you can see, forms four parts, and I've popped down exactly what I mean by that. Again, if I want to evaluate this, I can say, right... Events keep happening, it's ongoing mitigation to reduce impact. So perhaps seeing these hazards as more of a cycle is beneficial. However, this cycle here, I would suggest, is less suited to unexpected hazards. Okay, Perhaps we can't afford some stages again. We can't see progress over time here like perhaps we could with the park model. So if I start considering then my volcanic hazards... Again, we group everything in terms of primary and secondary. Remember, primary is going to happen straight away. Secondary happens afterwards. So primary here would be your pyroclastic flow, your superheated gas, your ash fallout. Secondary is likely to be things like your acid rain and your lahars. Again, if I start to think about breaking these down a little bit, I might group them even further and go economic, political, social and environmental. And you start to think about the way in which I classify my hazards. I might see some variation in hazards, as I've said here. Well, magnitude, the frequency, the randomness, predictability, that's all going to have an impact then on how I group these impacts. Then my short-term, my long-term responses. If I think about short-term, it's things that are going to happen sort of straight away. Long-term is perhaps happening months or years afterwards. It's just about checking, like in the exam, could you evaluate these? Would you have enough points to say... Would you be able to build up enough AO2 marks by critiquing each of these? And then obviously relating that and applying that to my case study. So your case study with volcanic hazard is Mount Pinatubo. And you'll notice here I've grouped it into AO1 and AO2. Mount Pinatubo was the largest eruption to occur in 50 years and hadn't erupted itself in over 600. So we had huge amounts of impacts with 350 people dying. 80,000 hectares of farmland is buried. 94% of deaths at evacuation camps, okay, were people from tribes. So if I want to evaluate that, I might ask myself these questions over here. Which ones are the most significant? Are they social, economic, environmental? Likewise, exactly the same with the responses. I might say, right, well, all of this here is my case study detail, my O1. But over here, there's some real scope, I think, for some solid AO2 marks, some solid evaluation. You've got little long-term management, really. You've still got the local people that are left vulnerable. Use the geological evidence. We're aware that the volcano erupted violently in the past, but still no preparation had been made. So you could argue, actually, 
here, they've been let down by the planning and the responses previously. If we go back to that park model and the hazard management cycle, the latter steps of each of those don't really appear to have happened here, which is perhaps why some of these responses aren't as great as they could have been. So if I move on from there to consider the nature of earthquakes, I've got to consider strain energy and that tension that builds up. I've got plates then that are going to jerk past each other. It's going to cause those shock waves to spread out from the focus. The key word here is epicenter. Ensure you understand what that means. So the nature of earthquakes then, in short, is affected by the type of margin, the rate of movement and the depth of the focus. Again, these points here sort of lead you on a little bit to thinking about Actually, what are the nature of earthquakes? If I consider each of those, does that make this better? Does this make this worse? So a bit like we did before with volcanoes, I can do exactly the same thing now for earthquakes. Again, I can start to group these into those four famous categories that we're really familiar with. In the exam, if worse came to worse, you'd start thinking generically, wouldn't you, about exactly what could the impact of an earthquake be if it happened right now? OK, those things there would start to give you some basic A01 marks, especially in those nine and 20 markers. Big things then, if I think about secondary seismic hazards, if I have an earthquake, it's highly likely that I'm going to get some of these happening as well. These are what we would class as secondary impacts, the tsunami perhaps being the most obvious one. If you take the Tohoku example, the tsunami was triggered as a secondary effect there. Measuring earthquakes. You've got your most famous method here, the Richter scale. So the magnitude of the earthquake is a logarithmic scale. And the Cali scale is measured using observations. Again, you can critique which one of the two here perhaps is the most reliable. And likewise, then, you've got your short-term and your long-term responses. Again, if I'm thinking about earthquakes, I've got to think about preparedness and adaptation and prevention. If I link that back again to my hazard management cycle, this sort of fits in really nicely. If I go back then and start thinking now about my famous earthquakes, we've done the Kobe example. You'll see here what I've done is I've broken down those impacts and those effects for you. And I've started last but not least about thinking about the responses. I think really you've got to group your ideas here into social, economic and political. I think those are the most logical categories to use. If I think socially, they've lost a lot of traditional buildings, obviously huge negative but they've got the new earthquake resistant homes in suburban areas. Economically, yes, the homelessness has been affecting the character of the city, linked to changing places there. But then they've just built 48,000 new homes. In case it's all about, can you sort of balance the positives and the negatives and come to some sort of judgment by the end? That's what you're going to score that AO2 the highest. Talked about Tohoku already. Start thinking about Tohoku, whether actually short term is better than long term or vice versa and potentially why you think that is. This one here, magnitude 9 earthquake. Okay, so one of the sort of top five biggest earthquakes we've had in recent years. Perhaps you might argue, is it the magnitude that's impacted these effects that you can see over here? I wouldn't suggest you learn all of these, but maybe I'd pause it here and sort of think about my top two or three that in the exam I would revisit and I would explain. Typhoon Haiyan is sort of your next big case study. Think here as well, like we've done for all the other hazards, about primary versus secondary. Consider here how you're going to weigh these up in the exam. This one I think is particularly impressive with the five metre storm surge and 400 millimetres of rainfall that's flooded up to a kilometre inland. I would consider here perhaps the primary effects being more severe than the secondary. Short term versus long term, I can see here just by looking at these points, there seems to be far more short term responses in comparison to long term. Think about again how that sits with your cycles, where roughly that would fit. Again, does this show particularly positive responses? Is this really strong evidence of preparedness and protection that you could use as part of a 20 marker? So I suppose this leads us nicely on to thinking a bit more about storms and the condition and the location that's necessary. So we know these are going to occur in low latitudes between 5 degrees and 30 degrees north and south of the equator. Not on the equator, obviously, as we've got the Coriolis force, not strong enough to make them swim. Think about the condition necessary for them. So warm water, about 50 metres below the surface, lots of evaporation. Convergence of air, so you've got the ITCZ, the intertropical convergence zone. So that boundary between warm and cold air and that warm air rising creates these perfect conditions for tropical storms. <laughs>
Here I've popped in your sequence for Tropical Storm. Again, just to recap the formation for you. If you need to pause it here, please do so. Remember your tropical storms are measured on the Saffir Simpson scale. So it's based on wind speed and how much damage might be caused. Frequency, we get about 100 of these a year. There's no clear spatial temporal pattern. And prediction and tracking mostly relies around satellite imagery and models. So like we've done previously, I can think about impacts again. Oh look, there's my famous four categories that we've talked about already. So I think it's pretty handy to group them by these in the exam. Look again, the keywords are popping up, aren't they? Prevention, preparedness, adaptation. Again, would you have a point to say for each of these if it was a 20 marker? That's the bit to be checking now. If I think about Sandy then, this has got to be like your big case study, I suppose. You want to say here, I think, that most responses were domestic. Okay, so most of them seem to be aimed at people. Think also about preparedness for the future. This little point down here. They've been sued for millions. Perhaps you could argue then, where were they on the hazard management cycle? Did any of that actually happen? Was it beneficial? The second most expensive hurricane in US history. I think that's a pretty good effect to use also as part of a 20 marker. Again, if you want to pause it here to go through these, please do. So last but not least, then we can consider wildfires. You've got three types. You've got what's called ground fires on the ground itself. Surface fire, which happens in leaf litter and crown fire, which moves rapidly through the canopy. So crown fires normally are the intense and fast moving ones. Here we go, look, famous four again. I can categorize the impacts of those wildfires. So socially I might have deaths, economic might destroy businesses. Political ones are normally quite big here as governments typically face a lot of criticism about preparedness. Environmental also equally as big, I think, with huge loss of habitats and species perhaps not returning after the fires. Conditions needed then and the causes, you can see them all here. So I've got to have lots of vegetation, so thick undergrowth, fine dry material sort of fuels it. The climate and weather, I'm going to need sufficient rainfall for vegetation growth for fuel. That fire behaviour slowly creeps along the ground versus rapid intense spread in the crown. So fires can throw debris obviously and jump across gaps in tree cover, don't forget. Again, if I think about what I'm going to need, lots of fuel, oxygen and that heat source. Perhaps I can get them caused naturally by things like lightning and volcanic eruptions. Most of these, however, are started by people. So think about accidental campfires, cigarettes, barbecues. So again, I can balance long term and short term. Just check. Could you explain each of these three in the exam? Things like public education, huge prevention strategy at the moment, especially in Australia. And that leads us on nicely then to your final case study of Black Saturday. So it's February 2009, Australia's worst bushfire disaster. The risk and the vulnerability here, it's covered in lots of eucalyptus forests, so it's going to burn pretty easily. It reaches temperatures of over 40 degrees Celsius. Effects-wise, 3,500 properties destroyed, 7,000 people displaced, but only 173 deaths. Over a million animals estimated to have perished. I think perhaps that's why it's most significant environmentally. Responses, they've got the new fire warning system. They've got brand new building regulations. There's a huge debate at the moment in Australia about whether actually housing should be allowed in high risk zones. Again, you could use that as a critique as part of your 20 markers. So I suppose if we take anything away from this, it's yes, most of us can talk quite generically about hazards. So we've probably got quite a lot of A01, but it's how critical you are and how well you evaluate each of these points. And short term and long term is one really easy way to do that. That's going to score you many more marks in the exam. So hope you found this really helpful. Go back, go through some of these things that you're unsure of. And if as ever, if you've got any questions, come and see me.